Thank you all for attending today's webinar on what you need to know as a brand about tvOS and Apple TV. Um, by way of introductions, my name is Jeremy Kidd, and I'm responsible for the media, entertainment, and sports practice here at Funware. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Funware, uh, we're a software and services firm based in Austin and LA that works with brands like Fox, CBS, and WWE to deliver and monetize their app experiences, both mobile uh, and increasingly these days uh, on streaming player platforms. So my partner today for the presentation is Brad Wright, uh, our manager of solution architecture. Uh, we've locked Brad in a closet for the past couple of months with orders to dissect tvOS um, and help identify the opportunities and gotchas of the new platform, uh, specifically for our customers. You're going to see the, the result of that hard work today, um, just like our customers have in person over the past few weeks. So uh, a couple of housekeeping items um, before we jump in. Uh, since we have such a large audience, we'll have all attendees muted. Uh, but please um, ask questions in the box to the right, and towards the end of the presentation, we'll answer them um, and then reach out to the folks in the email that we don't get to. Um, based on the res registrations, we are talking to a pretty diverse group today. This deck is designed specifically for the product owner role. Um, that product owner is the one that's responsible for feature level decisions on app projects. Um, though we will at times uh, go a little bit more technical as necessary. So with that said, let, let's jump into the presentation. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I've been an early adopter of nearly every single streaming platform. Can't tell you how excited I am that Apple is making a strong place to unify OTT on the big screen. Um, the folks around the office here know that this has become sort of my new religion. Um, and it's going to be a powerful way for our customers to reach the audience in the living room. Um, so I'll, I'll try not to steal any of Brad's thunder, but here are the highlights of the new device and, and uh, ecosystem itself. Uh, so first, we, we got new news over the past couple of days on release timing. Uh, apparently, according to Tim Cook, the pre-orders are going to start next Monday. Uh, October 26th, um, with shipping hopefully that same week. Um, so we, this is a sort of a here and now problem that we're that we're addressing. So moving to the next slide, um, you know, I, I get a lot of questions. You know, given that this has been out there for eight years, given that you know Android TV, Amazon, Roku, the whole rest of the population all have answers, and this tech isn't exactly new. Uh, the question is, why is this launch such a big deal for brands? Um, and, and when I when I approach it, I sort of look at it and say, hey, this is the absolute perfect recipe for owning uh, the eyeballs in the living room. Uh, first, it's an experience beyond simple video. So if you think about it, VOD was the first big shift in television towards set-top boxes and streaming players. Um, but now this is an opportunity to create an experience beside, in, and around that video. Um, and I, I think that's going to absolutely drive the next uh, the next wave of innovation for uh, what we see for streaming players. Uh, the next point there is ubiquitous content availability. Uh, Brad will get into a little bit later about what TVML is um, as far as a templated approach to developing new Apple TV applications. But because it's so easy and relatively inexpensive to build these apps, the long tail of brands, you know, all the way out to the single individuals that want to reach directly to their audiences have the ability to have a presence on this platform. But with that said, uh, you also have the un, you know, nearly unlimited power to invent amazing experiences with almost all of the iOS libraries actually being accessible to the device as well. And then the last point, and we, and we really shouldn't uh, miss this, you know, Apple is the world's most successful ecosystem builder. They proved it time and time again, so it's sort of never smart to, to bet against Cupertino. But if you think about it, this actually mirrors the strategy that Apple pursued with the original iPhone back in 2007. First, you build a beautiful product with a great UI, and then you layer on a developer program, um, you know, in subsequent years. Uh, and so as, as we jump to the next slide, and this is the last one, and then I'll let uh, the, the star actually take the stage and, and Brad dig in. But as we talk to the customers um, that Fundware actually uh, helps with these strategies, we're hearing a couple of things. First, uh, most developers are deploying templated-based apps for the holiday season this year and early 2016. 
Um, it's, a, it's a fairly straightforward, low cost, kind of quick win to get on the platform and be present to you know, capture that mind share of those folks that are going out this holiday season and, and buying Apple TVs. The immersive native experiences, um, these are the ones that actually depend more on Swift and Objective-C you know, native development are expected late 2016 and 2017, and that's gonna be directly relative to the uptake of the platform itself. And what that should tell us all, um, as folks that are worried about you know, where this is going and what we need to be doing on the new platform is that right now is the time to think big. So we've got this beautiful window of you know, 12 to 18 months where we can sit down and say, what does that companion second screen um, app experience look like alongside my video and my content and my gaming experiences that I'm creating uh, for the platform. And then we won't dig into this a lot today, but the, the wild cards out there obviously, you know, first and foremost, Apple's TV service that's been long rumored. Um, if Apple comes to you know the market with a VOD or a linear service for TV, you know, what what is that going to look like and what is that going to do to you know our partners that um, want to actually own that direct relationship with the audience? And then finally, app availability on, at launch. So as, as Apple um, rolls us out over the holiday season, how many of those applications are actually going to be available and will it be sticky enough to you know, launch that customer adoption that we're, that we're hoping for? So with all that said, um, like I said, I will uh, be quiet and let Brad Wright take the stage. So um, Brad, uh, go ahead. So one of the things I wanted to focus on first are what are the things that are new in tvOS? Um, key things that have come out with tvOS are number one, the focus engine. Uh, the focus engine is basically the bridge between your UI and your users. Um, it's something that if you think about it, kind of differentiates if I were airplaying an iPad app on my, my TV versus using a tvOS application. Um, it basically allows you to follow what the user is doing on the screen. And I think it's a key to um, basically creating a, an experience with your tvOS app that feels native to that platform, as opposed to just basically you know, an iPad app on a larger screen. Some other things that are available are the uh, cross-device interactions. Um, that's something that's going to create some pretty powerful uh, new opportunities. Um, with the old Apple TV, you know, we did not have the ability to, to pair a second screen experience with uh, an iPad app or, or an iOS app. Um, and that's something that can be possible now, and it'll create some new cool um, potential user experiences. The thing that I'm the most excited about um, is this open community. Um, the open community, if you think about it in the last you know, 10 to 15 years, every single major innovation that has come in software, I believe, can be tied back to open community. Um, you know, the ability to give developers um, the freedom uh, to blue sky, to create new things, uh, to learn from one another, to share ideas, has driven really compelling innovation. And I think it's something that has really bottlenecked um, the adoption around the older tvOS, or excuse me, Apple TV applications. Um, I think it's also important to identify some key details that are not available from a product owner's perspective. Um, first of all, push notifications. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Obviously, I can't take my, you know, my television in my, in my pocket, um, but uh, push notifications are not available. Um, also, iAd is not available. Um, Another thing that is not there is WebKit and web views. This one's a bit sneaky. Um, in the App Store today, at least 90% of applications have some form of a web view baked in. Um, that creates uh, some kind of interesting challenges when you're trying to create experiences for tvOS and for Apple TV apps uh, without the ability to have a web view. It can kind of change your content strategy. Uh, I think really, frankly, one of the key misses on behalf of Apple um, for tvOS is the inability right now to add a badge to an application icon on the home screen. Um, and to, to kind of illustrate that one, I want to sort of illustrate a use case. Imagine that you have a video series of content 
that your users are uh, following. You've seen that you know user A uh, watches this and they've watched it consistently. When they go away and you've added new content, if the user comes back to the home screen, uh, I think an ideal experience to draw that user back into your application would be to you know add an icon or excuse me add a badge to your icon that says hey new you know there's new content there's red one you know like on iOS. Um, unfortunately, that's not available. So uh, in order to message your user that there's new content available in your application, your user has to explicitly make the decision to hover over your app icon. Um, which would be nicer if you could just say, hey, there's new content and entice that user when they've launched the home screen back into your app. Um, but that's not available. I feel like that's a miss. Um, hopefully, though, actually, the docs have been changing a lot. Um, and, and hopefully that's something that gets fixed soon. Another key thing that's missing is local storage. Um, this is a big difference between the older versions. Um, and I'll geek out a little bit here. But basically, um, I think the biggest impact is around session storage. So. Um, basically, Apple now does not guarantee that anything that you store um, between sessions will be persisted across sessions. So what that implies is that any kind of session storage needs to be moved into the server side. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. There's um, a, con a small sort of workaround, but we'll cover that in a little bit. So moving on, um, one thing that I think needs its own slide is search. You know. Um, if, if you're not a very um, uh, familiar with search and, and where, why that's potentially been a problem for Apple in the past, uh, what is it? Why is it important to me? Really, the best way to think about search is it's a brand new marketing channel. This is a way that we can expose information that's buried within our applications to users when they're looking for content. Um, that's not something that was possible before. I think it's also important as a product owner to think about the fact that this is not something something like that's auto magic, you know, things like SEO uh, and web. Um, it's very sort of, oh, this just happens. Google goes and crawls my site. And then when somebody searches for it, if my SEO is good, then they find what I want them to find. The way that this is likely going to work, but again, the docs are shifting, so the, the path to execution on how to implement search isn't entirely clear yet. Um, beta one changed between beta one and two. Uh, beta 3 change between 2 and 3, so it's not exactly clear yet what's, how they're going to want us to implement this, but I would expect something very similar to how iOS 9 works. And effectively, what that looks like is, as you're developing your application, you identify content within your application, you register that content with Apple's API, um, content keywords, deep links, etc. cetera. Um, then that content is indexed using Apple's search index, and then that's exposed. Um, in iOS 9, obviously, you can provide fallback content um, for web. If the user doesn't want to download the app, obviously, that won't be available in tvOS because web views, again, aren't supported. Really, this is aimed at competing with Google. Previously, um, basically, any search about your application sort of ends at the App Store. Now you're able to take a layer down and, and provide content to users dynamically um, through search. That's something that I think is going to be very powerful in tvOS. Let's talk a little bit about design. Uh, tvOS design is primarily grid-based. It's something that should work very well in the existing Apple ecosystem. Um, but there's a couple of key things that our design team has sort of learned and observed as we're working on Apple TV, uh, excuse me, Apple TV slash tvOS projects now. Um, one thing is that the alerts take over the screen. Uh, and it's a very disruptive experience, so that's something that we would recommend, recommend minimizing. Uh, another thing is in the guidelines, it's clear that they don't want you to overbrand. Um, the encouragement is to use your content to brand as much as possible, um, as opposed to logos. Um, you can, though, use your own typography and colors and whatnot. Uh, a couple other details about design. Uh, we would recommend minimizing text inputs as much as possible. Um, one thing that would be really nice is if you could use Siri for dictation. Uh, that is not available right now today. So you, the, the experience on the right here, if you look at this screen with the user and password, what it looks like if you have a text input, you see your text input, 
you focus on that text input, everything else falls away and the keyboard is displayed. You then have to you know, type your uh, username and you know, click next. And you go through this sort of in and out UX and it's not a very ideal user experience. So um, another, another detail there would be, um, it's, I would not use this for you know, displaying long articles or, or, or text intensive content. Uh, because it'd be a little bit overwhelming on that large of a form factor. Another key detail from a design perspective, and this goes back to that whole badge problem that I mentioned earlier, is that the best way to message your users about new content is with the top shelf. Um, you can see this picture of the top shelf uh, below. What that looks like, sort of the way that you would message your user that you have new content, is say your user goes and scrolls over your application, the image in the top shelf can change. That's the best way that you can message your users that there's new content. And the key here is that that image and that content that gets displayed is dynamic. Um, you definitely do not wanna make that content static because otherwise uh, your users won't really have a, you don't have a voice to your users um, that there's new things available and that, hey, you should come back into my application. Um, a lot of our customers are primarily supported uh, through advertising on their Apple TV platforms. Um, uh, how is this gonna impact it? You know, one of the key benefits uh, with this new platform and the open community and, and the, the, the new features that are available is this creates a clearer picture of who your users are and what they're doing, what the life cycle of the way that they consume your content looks like. Um, it creates some new uh, branding opportunities, marketing opportunities around um, gamifying the viewing experience or cross-device interactions. Um, you know, longer term, this is going to imply that the uh, advertising and monetization strategy is going to need to be uh, evaluated along the way because this is going to create some new things from an advertising perspective. Another tricky kind of gotcha with the web view issue is that all your advertising needs to be native. This is very important. Um, if and as you're building on TVOS, we would highly recommend going and talking to whatever advertising providers you currently use and make sure that all the advertising is fully native. Um, often you'll find situations where an advertising partner displays a native video in an HTML5 wrapper. If that happens, it won't work. So it's going to be really important for our customers uh, to go and, and, and you as you go and, and, uh, and build on the Apple TV uh, TVOS platform to make sure that all your advertising is fully native. Another really cool opportunity with TVOS versus traditional um, iOS is the fact that TVOS can be hosted um, versus the kind of typical flow. Traditional iOS, um, there are binaries that are basically downloaded to user's phone and installed. If you have to make a change, if you've been through iOS development much at all, you will have encountered situations where there was a bug or there was a problem or there was a terms of service violation or whatever, and we needed to force an app update. The user had to go reinstall, and that's a bit of a bummer. The cool thing about the way that TVOS works from a hosted perspective is it's a lot more similar to web. Um, you can basically host your uh, template generation, all the, the uh, MVC architecture on the server side and deliver changes dynamically. Um, that provides some advantages because if you think about it from a hotfix perspective, it's a whole lot easier to update something on the server side versus delivering a whole new application to a user's phone. That's a, that's a big positive. Let's talk about social media. You know, Jeremy mentioned ubiquitous content earlier. I think um, a couple of these sort of social flows and social integrations on iOS are also very ubiquitous. You know, if I had a nickel for every time that I heard somebody say, oh, and I want them to be able to share it, you know, oh, and, oh I want them to be able to sign up with Facebook, you know, I'd probably be a very wealthy man. Um, with the new web view restrictions, the fact that you don't have web views, um, the social sharing is not gonna be available uh, like it is on iOS. In addition to that, um, OAuth, a traditional kind of 
uh, sign up with OAuth is also not available. So if I want somebody to sign up with Facebook, that's not something that's going to work. And um, I'll talk about some potential challenges there as well. Uh, let's talk about TDML kit for a minute. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot of questions so far about what is TVML kit. Uh, TVML kit consists of two things. Um, number one, uh, TVML, which is basically an XML-based markup language that allows you to kind of define the structure of what your views look like. Um, and also, and then TVML.js. Um, TVML.js is basically a JavaScript framework that's kind of a wrapper of the older iteration of how TVOS apps were being built. Um, Moving on a little bit, what are the benefits and disadvantages uh, to TVML? Um, the benefits are the time to market. Um, it's something that's easy uh, to spin up, like Jeremy mentioned. Uh, in particular, it's very much geared toward content apps. Um, content apps, um, you know, they're delivering video content or whatever. It, it, it's easy to uh, fit all that into TVML. Some disadvantages here are that uh, the customizations are limited. If you're gonna add a whole bunch uh, of hierarchy or complex UIs, you're gonna be better off um, doing uh, Objective-C probably from the beginning. And um, the, the, the templates can be extended and customized, but they are predefined. Uh, one, one benefit though, if you do have an older version of a TV, an Apple TV application, the difference in the templates from the older version and the newer version, there's a one-to-one -one relationship. So every TV uh, ML app, uh, excuse me, template that was in the older version is also represented in the newer version. So it, you're not gonna have to re-architect your views um, to support it. A few questions we've gotten here. Um, you know, one question is, can my iOS engineers work with this? Um, yes, all of this can be built on Objective-C. It can be part Objective-C, part TVML, um, it can be all TVML, um, and iOS engineers should find this whole environment, the development environment, everything very familiar, and they will be able to develop uh, TVOS apps if they're already you know, comfortable uh, iOS engineers. Another question that we've gotten um, that we see a lot is, will this be backward compatible with older generations of the Apple TV? The answer to that question is no. Um, if you would like to have, a, if you do not already have an existing uh, Apple TV app on the older generation and you would like to build one, you basically have to do uh, two separate code bases that need to be maintained. Uh, another question that we've gotten quite a bit is, if I have an older version of the Apple TV, how difficult is it to port? Um, the answer is it's not difficult. Um, there's a, Again, there's a few gotchas, but basically the older JavaScript uh, maps very cleanly into uh, the new TVML.js framework. And so like HTTP requests, um, player controls, all the details that are present um, are represented in TVML.js plus some advantages. Um, the only real trick there is, is around local storage. If you were using local storage um, to deal with some, some session information and some other things, um, you're gonna wanna move that. So if you already have a, a mechanism on the server side to, to persist sessions, you can use that. You can also use CloudKit or iCloud. Um, it, it's, it's pretty simple. A small workaround to some of the local storage is this NS user default. Basically, you can store a megabyte of data in there, but for anything significant, absolutely it's best practice to move that to the server side. Also, the, the resource management, to, to kind of follow on that thought, the resource management um, is, they, they absolutely kind of press you to be very judicious about uh, downloading content on demand and some other things like that. So um, as much as you can sort of set your architecture up to store things server side and to fetch things on demand, it will be better. How will user authentication change? This is another question we've got. So if you picture a use case where, say for example, you have some free content on a website and you have some paid content on a website. And so you say a user signs up with Facebook on your website and then purchases a subscription to paid content on your website. They then are going to obviously expect that if they download your tvOS app, they have access to that same paid content. Well, because of the OAuth issues that we mentioned before, 
um, what would be necessary in order to basically restore that user on your tvOS application, you would have to um, our best practice I mean there's a few ways to do this, but we would recommend something along these lines. Basically, you create a flow on your website whereby the user can log in, access a pin for the TVOS app, then they go to their TVOS app and log in, accessing the uh, a native API that you've exposed on your server side that allows them to enter the pin, and then you can basically join that user with their paid user on their TVOS app, even though they have a Facebook account and they can't sign in with OWASP on their TVOS. Then they're able to see the, uh, the content that they've already subscribed for. Um, there's a couple other ways to do that, but I feel like in terms of what we're seeing in the marketplace today, um, that's kind of the most common one, and users will be familiar with that sort of experience. Final thoughts. Um, one thing I think that's really important and, and, and a bit game-changing with this new tvOS version is it is meant to be, as opposed to your iPad, it's meant to be one to many. So from a strategic perspective, um, if you think about that, that I'm, I'm speaking to more than one person, potentially, in my application experience, that's going to help to avoid pitfalls that you might encounter if you're just thinking about it from a UX of an iPad. Another key thing from a strategic perspective that we want to highlight is focus on media. You know, photos, videos, they're going to play very well. Um, things like text, not as well. Um, another, another really key one that I, I, we've seen here, I mean, this is a lot like when the iPad came out. Start small, but we would highly recommend starting now. The reason we would recommend that is real estate, as everybody knows who's working on iOS as it stands, real estate on a user's phone is a very, very precious thing. If you wait a year uh, to see kind of how the cards you know, fall on what development looks like on this platform, then not only do you have the challenges of, of developing at a higher curve, you also have the challenge of fighting for real estate that's probably already occupied by other applications. If instead you can get a foothold on someone's screen with a smaller but effective first version, then making updates and improving that application, uh, you have a much higher chance of maintaining that real estate um, within the context of uh, your user's Apple TV. The last one that I've sort of just touched on is iterate. Um, like, like I've mentioned several times, uh, the documentation around this is changing you know, by the week. Uh, things that were set up one way last week are, are different uh, this week. So um, I would absolutely recommend um, getting, a, getting a presence out there with a plan toward iterating and growing and learning um, as in a very agile way as uh, this, this goes forward. So with that said, uh, I'm going to pass it back to Jeremy, and uh, we're going to go through some questions that we got in the chat. Um, I've got uh, a couple of questions that I think are pretty interesting. Um, the first one, Brad, is um, it came in, what can I leverage from my existing iOS app? That's a great question. Um, the answer is it depends. It is absolutely possible to leverage pieces of code for tvOS that are currently in iOS. That said, um, T iOS libraries that you leverage in your code base or SDKs or whatever, uh, they might contain pieces that are not supported in tvOS. That being the case, um, you need to basically use only the pieces that are available on tvOS and iOS. Uh, you can't use both pieces. In addition to that, um, because the UI is a bit different, because of the focus engine is different, um, some of the assets are different, like the parallax images that you know are kind of around uh, of the web that you can sort of see. Um, it's it's going to be necessary to uh, go through that in detail. There's not a really a template answer for that necessarily, but it certainly isn't like you're not going to be able to use anything from your iOS application. You will definitely be able to leverage parts, but it's kind of a case by case basis. Awesome. And actually, uh, one that I'll take here, um, and I kind of love this question. Uh, will the Apple TV outsell the iPad? 
Um, and so I'm going to sort of sidestep the premise in that uh, I have no earthly idea. You know, Apple, the iPad is approaching sort of the mature um, section of their product cycle, and Apple TV, I think, is ready to launch in a big, big, big way. Uh, but I, I love the idea that both devices are, are primarily focused at consuming content. And, and so if I have a dollar to put into uh, app development for, you know, a platform or two platforms or whatever the case is, you know, where and why should I focus on one versus the other? Um, I, I think obviously for the next 12 months, the iPad is an embedded audience that, that you need to reach out to. Um, but at some point, very, very, very quickly, critical mass is going to get to the point where if you're particularly a sports video um, uh, media entertainment brand, it, it's going to be you know, critical to your success to actually be on that platform as well. Um, so, uh, Brad, how much flexibility do I have with uh, the TVML templates? Oh, that's a good question, too. So um, the answer is quite a lot. Um, you, the nice thing is they're sort of structured where if you need to get something in the market, um, there's a nice, very clean, very consistent mechanism to create your experience. That said, you know, again, sort of contrasting with the older version, the newer version uh, has the ability to customize kind of to your heart's content. I mean, there's obviously limitations there, um, but you know, creating unique experiences are absolutely possible. I think the one key caveat though is um, there's a benefit to user has to actively kind of think about and figure out, for lack of a better word, uh, the better off it'll be, the more natural it feels, the higher chance you have of your user really having a favorable view of your application and, and kind of creating a positive experience for that user. Great, um, we have, we're running right up against our time, so let, let's do one more um, and sort of limit, this is a big one, so limit it to probably 30 seconds. Okay. Um, Generally speaking, how long does it take to build TVML apps? Wow, that definitely varies wildly. Um, there's an implication here that on your end, as a, as a product owner, you have a strategy around uh, delivering your content, hosting your content, managing it, you know, and all that. Um, but, you know, assuming that all of that's in place, and depending on the scale and scope of it, I mean, it could be somewhere as quick as probably six weeks um, to as much as, you know, 20 weeks or 24 weeks, again, kind of de depending on how ambitious you are. If you're, if you're building some deep 3D game, you know, it's probably going to take quite a while. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the uh, broad, broad stroke answer. Great. Now, thanks again. Um, we have a number of other questions that, uh, since we've run out of time, we'll actually address via email. But um, I, I, from the whole team here at Funware, we really appreciate uh, taking the time this afternoon to uh, talk through this with us. Um, and if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to uh, Funware, info at funware.com, or even me directly, jkidd, K-I-D-D, at funware.com. And we'll follow up with an email um, with a link according to this presentation. Um, but uh, thanks again for your time, and uh, talk soon. Bye.